Christian martyr. He actually was part of fulfilling what Acts 1.8 said. But before Jesus ascended, he promised his disciples that they would be filled with the Spirit, empowered from on high, empowered to be his witnesses. And in the Greek, that word witness is martyrios, which means martyrs. I've done it in the past. I said, how they want to be a witness for the Lord? And all, and all kind of hands go up. Now that word in the Greek means, means martyrios. How many want to be martyrios? <laughs> But Stephen was the first Christian martyr, and he was stoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Saul, who would, after conversion, be the apostle Paul, and most here would be aware of that, he was at this time a persecutor of the church. And so that's what's referred to here. So Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. 
But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, here's the sermon to, to this Simon from, from Peter the Apostle. May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Again, preaching mentioned the second time here without the content of these specific uh, sermons to the crowds. Now verse 26, we go back to Philip. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, the court official Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate this generation? For his life is removed from the earth. Verse 34. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. We don't have the content of this sermon, but we know he used scripture and he preached Jesus. Verse 36. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look! water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. When I was in college, uh, my second year, my sophomore year in undergraduate studies, uh, I became the lab assistant for earth science. 
And uh, later on, I would be a teaching assistant for uh, Old Testament, but I had yet passed my undergrad. I had to pass that first before I could become a uh, teaching assistant in the theology uh, department for Old Testament. But uh, the second year in undergrad, the, the, I'd had this class, Earth Science, and the professor there, I remember his name, Dr. Maline, and he asked me, he wanted me to be his lab assistant. Well, when you're in college, you need a job. And I said, yes, let me think about it, yes. And, I, and I, I, especially when you don't have a car or transportation, if you can get a job right there on campus, hey. And I made $4.50 an hour, I still remember. And I was glad to get it, too. But before I graduated, I went up to $5 an hour. I got a raise. Some of you young people are saying, well, what, four fifty? what can you buy for that? Not much, but hey, it's better than zero, zero. All right. So at any rate, I, I worked for this man. And one of the things that we had to do in earth science class was he had this set of rocks. And there was about 35 or 40 rocks. And he'd have them on a display. And what the students had to do is before the end of the semester, they had to be able to look at these rocks and they could touch them too and, and whatever they wanted to do. But they had to look at these rocks and they had to put on a piece of paper. Yeah, not everybody carried around a little laptop computer then. It was on paper, pencil and paper. They had to put in the, uh, on the paper, it was part of their test, part of their grade, they had to correctly identify these 35 to 40 rocks, be it granite, or be it malachite, or be it pyrite, or be it gneiss. I still remember some of these names, and that's been a year or two ago. <laughs> All right. And so uh, part of my job duty was to help them be able to discern which of these rocks was which kind, because I wanted them to get a good grade. And so that was part of my task, because the professor, he would spend some time with some of them, but he was busy with a lot of other things too, so a lot of that fell to me. And so I'd be there and I'd be helping them. And what you would do with these rocks that were in this display is the color would tell you a lot about what it was. Certain ones would be black, some green, some white, and what have you, some, some yellow or goldish in nature. So you could separate them, by, but that wouldn't tell you the whole thing because there were lots of rocks that would be similar in color. Texture would tell you some, so you could feel them and be if it was smooth or if it was grainy or be it like sandpaper, that would tell you something. The heft. Heft is how heavy it feels compared to its size. You would do that and be able to tell a little bit more about it. It's shine or it's sheen. In other words, was it dull or was it shiny? That would tell you a little bit more about it. And then it would be the taste of it could tell you. I never really went for that one. I didn't pick those rocks up. At the, I'm kind of one of these people. My wife will tell you if something falls from the table onto the floor, I do not believe in the five-second rule. <laughs> And if I think somebody handled it before me, I don't want, I know, I just, I don't take a chance. And so I'm one of those kind of people, right? Now my wife and my son are like, ah, oh, it's still good, you know. <laughs> Not me, I can't do that sort of thing. So I never went for the taste. If they wanted to do taste, that was on their own. But not me, I didn't do that taste then. But through all of these things, what it was, is it was to be able to tell, to discern what something was versus what something wasn't. And one of the rocks that we had to identify is called pyrite. Now, if you've never heard that particular name before, you've probably heard of fool's gold before. Anybody heard the word fool's gold? That it's pyrite. It looks like gold, feel like gold, but there are certain ways that you can tell whether it's really gold or whether it's not gold. All right? You can tell whether it's gold or whether it's pyrite. You can tell whether it's false or whether it's true. And this morning, in these couple different, you probably saw as we read, it's kind of broken down, even on the back of your bulletin, there's kind of like two little sections. There's two individual sermons. One is to a man named Simon, who had been a magician, to Simon the Magician, and the other is to an Ethiopian eunuch. And between these two, we're going to be able to tell signs, all right, indicators, uh, characteristics of false faith versus true faith. How many want for your faith to be true faith and genuine? And I will tell you, it's an important thing. Any preacher worth his salt who's ever read through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Jesus said in that day, there will be many who will say, Lord, Lord, and yet they're going to hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. 
These are people that had some semblance of the faith in some form or fashion that themselves will thought that they were part of the faith. They were self-deceived or perhaps satanically deceived, but deceived nonetheless. And they thought that they were genuine. And yet Jesus said, depart from me for I never knew you. How many want for our faith to be true? Paul says, make sure, uh, make your calling and election sure. All right. And so here it is. The difference between false faith and true faith. As I mentioned when we were reading through this, this is after the persecution of Stephen. Stephen's been killed. He has been the first Christian martyr, part of fulfilling Acts 1.8. And if you remember, the rest of Acts 1.8 said this. Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses, my martyrs, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, so far in our series on the book of Acts, we've had sermons go forth in Jerusalem and we're spreading out to Judea. Well, now we get Samaria and then a little bit to the uttermost parts of the world with the Ethiopian eunuch. How many know what Jesus says is exactly what happens, right? So here we are in Acts chapter 8. Philip, who was also one of the deacons appointed at the same time as Stephen in Acts chapter 6. Philip is a deacon. He's one who served tables. But he goes out from this persecution. He starts spreading out as do other believers. And he preach Jesus as they go. And I like to think of it this way. And I've mentioned this concept many times. What the devil intends for bad, God can use for good. The devil thought, ha, I'm persecuting the church. God says, and my message of the gospel is spreading out as they go. How many are thankful to be on the winning team if you're in Christ, right? And so here it is, as the gospel is spreading, and Philip is part of that, and he starts preaching in Samaria. And I won't go through all the things with Samaria, but if you know anything about Samaria... John chapter 4, Jesus and the woman at the well. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. The believers in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, the way that they had been brought up, they would have had a predisposition against any kind of association with the Samaritans. And yet here, the gospel is going forth unfettered to Samaria. And what a wonderful testimony it is. This world will always say, why can't we all get along? Let's all come together. Uh, a, you know, and, and they seem to think they can make utopia. And every time they do that, murder and all kinds of wickedness goes forth. Only in Christ do the barriers come down. Only in Christ is it that those who have been opposed, for whatever reason, individuals or different ethnicities, only in Christ can those walls come down. And we say, you're my brother, you're my sister, if you're in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so here it is, is that what happens? Philip is preaching. And he comes there, and many are believing. And not only Philip is preaching Christ, and great signs and wonders are happening. Now, Philip doesn't focus on the signs and wonders. He focuses upon preaching Christ. But these signs and wonders are happening, and the city is rejoicing. And many are being baptized. And one of those who hears Philip's message is this man named Simon the Magician. His name is Simon. And he had been a magician. He had done all kinds of magic arts that captivated the attention of the people. Well, now that the gospel comes, and Philip has preached Jesus Christ... These people don't really want anything to do with the magic arts. And how many know that's part of what happens when someone becomes a believer? There was a brother here a few weeks ago, and he was sitting about midway here. And he's here sometimes on Wednesday nights. And he wouldn't mind me saying that to you because he gave the testimony to me and a few others that were here after church that night. But he, had been, he asked me, he says, Pastor, do you have a metal trash can? I said, no. I didn't know why he was asking I said, no, all we've got are these plastic things that the, that the city gives us. I said, uh, I said, uh, why do you need, a, uh, you need a metal trash can? He said, yes. He said, because I've got these tarot cards and I want to burn them because now I follow Jesus. I don't want nothing to do with those tarot cards. I said, brother, if you don't find one, you call me. I go down and buy you one. <laughs> Williams Hardware is right down here. I said, well, that's a good thing. When you're following Jesus, even without someone having to tell you, I mean, sometimes there'll be things of which you need instructed in God's word to be sure. But how many, when you were a Christian, there were certain things when you were converted that you didn't think anything about when you were not converted. And no one even, but you feel conviction about it now in your heart and in your mind. Right? When you follow Christ, Christ is in one direction and Lord knows tarot cards are in the other. Right? Amen. And we shouldn't have anything to do with those sorts of things. Or them uh, 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 horoscope things or these sorts of things. You don't need to look to the stars if you know the one who made the stars. 
right? And so here it is, is that what happens is the whole culture starts turning from this message. So Simon has lost his popularity. And he hears this message of Philip. And he especially, if you reread this, you will find that Simon was especially captivated by the signs and the miracles that he saw being done. Now, how many are thankful God does signs and, and miracles? I will tell you, there are those who will say that the uh, miracles don't happen anymore. They've reached me too late. I know that God does. God, in, now people have, in all fairness, people have different definitions of what the word miracle is. My miracle, it's a miracle I'm breathing this morning. Yeah. I know it's a miracle you're breathing this morning too, but you wouldn't have that breath word apart from divine intervention. Yeah. Right? And so divine intervention, God still intervenes in the affairs of men. And aren't you thankful for his hand and for his touch and for his encouragement? Yeah. It is really a shame now, do I think miracles are for sale? No. Do I think that God does miracles so that certain people can say, look at all that I did? No. Do I think it is that you can, uh, you know, give X number of dollars and receive what these charlatans tell you'll receive if you give it? No, I don't. But do I believe God still does signs and wonders and miracles? I'm thankful that he does. Aren't you? But here it is, is that, that Simon, he's captivated. And it says that he believed, but his belief will, sh will show itself to be false, not genuine, because of certain things that will happen. He says that he believes, and he's even baptized. And then he follows Philip around for a little while. So he has, he, here it is, he's made a profession of faith, he's even been baptized, and he's even in church. We don't know what the period of time is, but he followed Philip around for at least a period of time. Well, then the church in Jerusalem hears about what's going on in Samaria. And they send Peter and John to them to check things out, make sure that things are uh, valid, so to speak, and that they're hearing the gospel and to give uh, an official seal, if you will, to the folks being converted there in Samaria. And thanks be to the Lord. It was a genuine move of God. They had genuinely heard the gospel. But there was one fellow there, at least, Simon, who was a false convert. Because he comes to them, and what does he want to do? But he wants to buy the power of God. He sees the apostles lay hands on people, and the spirit given, and the power shown, and he wants that to be his own. So here, I told you there were going to be some marks of false faith versus marks of genuine faith. And the marks of false faith, uh, they have a... They'll all start with the same letter. The true faith ones, I wasn't able to do that. But the false faith ones, here's the first thing that shows that Simon's faith was a false faith. One, he was concerned with popularity. It became popular at that moment anyway to not be a magician, but to be called a Christian. There was something going on there amongst the people. And so Simon, he wanted to be part of this popular thing that was happening. How many know popularity is a very fleeting thing? You have anybody that's in any kind of the, the entertainment business of this world, they're here today and gone tomorrow, right? They're the big name one day and then who are you the next, right? The thing is, popularity, it's a fleeting thing. And it's not something that Christians should seek after as popularity. Not only is it very fleeting, but usually if you're, let's say usually, I would say always, if you're seeking popularity with this world, it's a mark of not genuine faith in Christ. You go back in the Old Testament, the people of God, Israel, in the book of 1 Samuel, what do they do? But they want a king. They hadn't had a king. God didn't want them to have a king. God foreknew they would have a king in Deuteronomy 17, but that's a story for another day. But he didn't want them to have a king, but they wanted a king. You know why they wanted a king? Because they wanted to be like all the other nations of the world. To do what's popular. How many know if everybody's doing it, most of the time, that's a warning sign. It's probably something that shouldn't be done. Right? As far as seeking out popularity. Popularity can, can be a, a, a bad thing if you go into, and most of the time it is. If you go indeed into the, from the Old Testament into the page of the New Testament, Jesus said in John chapter 15, He said this, If they hate you, and the implication is that they will hate you, if they hate you, know that they hated me before they hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you're not of the world, the world hates you. How many know hate and popularity don't really go together, right? But it is that Jesus in preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, at the end of what we commonly call the Beatitudes, Jesus said, 
Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And he said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. In other words, the prophets weren't popular back in their day. Even though at Jesus' time, the people would say, Hey, these were the prophets of old. But when they were the prophets of old, they weren't treated very well. And their message wasn't very popular. Kind of like those painters. You ever heard of a painter? That during the time that he painted, he was penniless. But now that he's dead and gone, they say it's worth a gazillion dollars, right? Well, they weren't popular in their time. The prophets weren't. Jesus, how popular was he? Well, he was popular for a period of time, but they ended up saying crucify, crucify. The New Testament church already experienced the persecution coming with the uh, calling on the carpet of Peter and John, being thrown in jail that we talked about and with the martyrdom of Stephen. How many know the things of this world are always an enmity with God? And if we're seeking out popularity, just because it's the popular thing going on, even if it is, it's the Christian thing, so we're going to be popular and do the Christian thing. But if you're not genuinely converted, that's a sign of, of false faith. Right. I remember I was in high school and there was a, uh, a group called the Power Team. Some may remember them. There was a group called the Power Team. And, and uh, uh, I won't say that all that they did was good. All that they did was bad. But I'm, I'm a teenager at the time and here this big thing's coming. And I wanted my friends to know Jesus. So there was a friend I had. And I invited him. I said, please come, come. And we went out to the Civic Center. Those who've lived here a long time know Lee Civic Center used to be where everything was. That's right. We didn't have Harborside or Calusa Sound or whatever they call it now. We didn't have Germain or Tico or whatever they're calling them. It was Lee Civic Center. That's where he went for everything. Down there by where Brother Kenny lives. <laughs> and so it, you went there for everything. And they were there at the Civic Center, and I invited my friend. His name was Richard. And I invited my friend down there to the, to the Civic Center, the power team. And at the end of it, the, the, uh, I don't even remember all that was said and done. To be honest, I was just mostly praying for him the whole time that he would somehow be convicted and drawn into Christ. It came at the end of the service, and they had the altar call, so to speak. And this stadium packed with people, what happened? But... A bunch of people would raise their hand that they want, and my friend was one of them. I was so happy. But yet, as it turned out, he was doing what was popular. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that every crusade or stadium thing is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, whether it be in that context or any context, it can be that people do what seems to be the thing to do at the time, but the conversion isn't genuine, right? And that's what seemed to be with him, because he went down, but then when I talked with him afterwards, it's like, there's no change. There's nothing different. He doesn't have any concern about the things of God. The true marks of faith aren't there. Some of you will be familiar with history. Christianity was persecuted up until an emperor named Constantine. Constantine came and he made it where the, he said he was converted to Christianity. And he said that that meant everybody in his empire was a Christian. How many know that ain't the truth, right? And, and then the things became so watered down. So popularity, that's one. He was concerned with popularity. That's a sign that his conversion, his faith wasn't genuine. Here's the second one. Not only with popularity, but prominence. You say, don't those two mean the same thing? No. Popularity meant he was doing what was popular at the moment. How many know there's most of the time Christianity hasn't been popular? By, by the way, 2 Timothy 4.1, some of you know that, where Paul says, preach the word in season and out of season, it means when it's popular and when it's, and I don't know, mostly it's not. <laughs> All right, throughout scripture. But here, he not only, Simon the magician, not only wanted to be part of what was popular at the moment, but he wanted to be prominent. In other words, he wanted to be at the head of what was going on. He had been the head before. He had been a standout before. And all the people came to him. He wanted it to be like that. He wanted to be like one of the uh, apostles. He wanted to be one that was at the head of the class, so to speak. He wanted to be prominent even amongst the movement, which was popular at the time. He wanted to be prominent and have an elevated position. How many know Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you will be the servant of all. Scripture also teaches not many should want to become teachers or those who would be prominent as the world may look at it because there's a harder, uh, there's a harder uh, uh, judgment for those who are in such positions. He had no, no, no idea of uh, living up to any responsibility. He just wanted to be prominent. 
We want to be prominent at the head. I mean, pride comes before fall. Next is this, prosperity. He wanted to be prosperous. And some may say, well, wait a minute. Simon doesn't say, give me money. He's willing to give money for the, to, in order to have this power. So how do you get prosperity out of it? How many know he wanted to give money to get this power so that then he could get money? That's what he did as a magician was he had this power which he could give money. He wanted to give money in order to... I know that doesn't happen anymore. But back then he wanted to give money and pay for something, religiously speaking, so he could get this power and then make money off of it. Now, don't get me wrong. There are certain ones that God has to be prosperous, certainly in the family of God and in the in the world at large. There are those who don't know Christ and yet in terms of worldly goods are very prosperous. But, uh, and we didn't read it because it wasn't a sermon, but back in Acts 4, Barnabas has talked about and he was a man of means. And so certainly God's people can be blessed in these ways. I'm not saying that they can't, but that, and, 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 and God's favor is upon them in those areas of their life. And how many know when you do become a Christian, there does tend to be some prosperity that comes to you, even so to speak, of this world of good life. Well, you ain't, uh, you ain't down there and, uh, doing certain things that cost a bunch of money anymore. And now here it is. Uh, things tend to go better for you if you're not engaged in those sinful activities, right? How many found that to be the case? You become a Christian and, hey, look at this. I'm not spending money on this, 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 and this, and this that are all sinful things. And so there's... There's little extra in the in the bank account. But this man, he wanted to be prosperous. He was chasing after the power. He was chasing after the prosperity. He was chasing after the dollar. And you know what Simon says to him? May you and your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could buy this power of God. The Gaithers wrote a song about the church. And part of the line says, says there have been those who throughout the ages, like Simon the magician, have thought they could barter on the open market that power which cannot be bought or sold. How many are thankful the Lord sits in heaven and he doesn't need the gold and silver of men, so to speak, in order to, to uh, he can bestow his gifts and his power. And aren't you thankful for that? Amen. And here it is. This man wanted to buy this power. Any of you ever talked with somebody, and I'll just, I won't mention any names specific here, but you ever talked to somebody about the gospel and one of the hindrances that they have, that they'll bring up is because there's all these uh, money grubbing preachers on the TV with the, the bad hair and bad theology. And I can't speak too much about hair. Mine ain't nothing to speak of, but they, but they, they got, they, they've seen these charlatans with the air conditioned dog houses or whatever they say they got. How many have ever had that be an encumbrance of sharing the gospel, right? Because that's what they think it's all about. And that ain't what it's all about. The salvation that God bestows, thanks be to the Lord, is something that all the money in this world couldn't buy. For we have been redeemed, if you are redeemed, with the price far above gold or rubies or precious stones, but with the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. Amen. So here it is, he says to them, uh, this man, a sign that he's not a genuine uh, believer in genuine faith. It's a false faith, is he's consumed, consumed with the ideal of this world's goods, with that of prosperity for the sake of prosperity. Finally here, the last thing that I'll point out that shows Simon was not a man of genuine faith is when he is confronted by Peter and he says, may your gold and silver perish with you. And I will tell you, some of you, may, if you go home and read that in a translation called the Phillips translation, it's a, <laughs> it's very strong, but in very strong words, Peter says there, he says, may it perish with you. And what is it? You're in the gall of bitterness. He says, repent of your wickedness. Again, there are those who will say repentance is not a part of gospel preaching. We have been through so many sermons already. How many of repentance keeps coming up? Over and over and over again. Repentance. Why? Because we're sinners. We need to repent. Gospel commands us to repent and trust in Christ. But at any rate, here's the last one. He wanted preserved from judgment. Notice what Simon says to him, if you go back and read this portion of the scripture, when Peter confronts him and say, says, repent, pray to God that you will be spared of the intention of your heart. What is it that he says? He doesn't even want to pray himself. He says, you pray for me that this may not come upon me. 
He doesn't say, you pray for me that my heart will be changed. You pray for me that I would yield to the Spirit and walk in righteousness instead of in sin. He doesn't have any kind of indication in his prayer that he wants to genuinely repent and turn and go the other direction. He just wants saved from the judgment. He wants preserved from the judgment. He wants saved from hell, but he doesn't want saved from sin. How many know I used to put this way? There's a lot of people that want fire insurance. But very few people want to be on fire. <laughs> in order to be on fire for God. A lot of people want fire insurance in case, just in case, you know, in case this thing is really real. I want to have some fire insurance. But there's no indication in their heart that they actually have a burning in their heart for the things of God, for scripture, for prayer, for the family of God. This man was not concerned. He didn't even pray himself. He wanted Peter to pray for him. Says you pray to God that this one come on. He just wanted to preserve from the judgment. Now, how many know it is right to want to flee the wrath to come? Amen. It is right to want to be preserved from hell, to not be in the place where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. Amen. That's a right thing. That having been said, I will tell you, if that's all that someone is concerned with and they have no fervor for the things of God whatsoever, it's a very good sign that their faith might not be genuine, that that's all that they're interested in. Now, what happens is, is after this, the second part of this message, the second half, if we dealt with signs of false faith, now we're going to deal with signs of true faith. And what happens is, is after talking about Peter and John coming to Samaria, and then, uh, then going back and preaching the word as they went, we switch back to Philip, the guy that God used to start this revival in Samaria. And what is Philip? There's this big revival going on. And what does God tell him to do? He sends an angel, actually, to tell him, leave this revival and go to this desert road. <laughs> and if you do some research on it, there were two roads that went from Jerusalem to this specific spot where this Ethiopian eunuch would have been coming back and forth from. And one was widely traveled and one was not. He was called to the one that was not. And it was, it was a, a, a deserted kind of road. Not many people traveled it. And he's traveling it. It's a desert area. Very hot. It's in the heat of the day. How many had some of the heat of the day from the parking lot and went to the door this morning, right? Sun's working extra overtime out there. And Brother Todd says that the hottest place in Fort Myers is this sidewalk right out here. <laughs> I think he's got it right. We used to have a big tree out there, but... Uh, but it went down and now it's hot. But at any rate, here it is, is that, that he, Philip, is told to leave the revival and to go to this deserted road. And you know what he does? He leaves the revival and goes to the deserted road. Oh, that's a miracle of God right there when there's obedience, right? This man of God, he's obedient under the call of God. Because I will tell you, as a, as a, as a, as a preacher, as, as an individual, you want to be, it, it, all kind of things are going on and people are getting saved and the apostles are there and all this stuff. You want to stay there, but he was called to go to this deserted road. How many know that's a, that shows humility on the part of Philip, that he was willing to be obedient to God and to go where he doesn't even know what this holds. And there's just one person there he's going to talk to and he leads the multitudes and goes to this one person, humility. There's also humility on the part of the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch, I won't go all into it, but the Ethiopian eunuch here, if you do study on it, he's like the secretary of the treasury for the nation. So he's a man of, of prominence. He's a man that is esteemed in his home country. And he's probably what's called a god fear. god fear meant he had come to know something of uh, uh, God, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come to know something of the Old Testament, and he'd come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage of some sort, and he ended up at great cost to him. Notice when Philip approaches, he's reading from Isaiah, and he had purchased this scroll, and it cost him a, it wouldn't have been a cheap proposition for him to get this, for him to take this journey all the way from Ethiopia up to Jerusalem, buy a scroll that has Isaiah in it, and he's on his way back, and he's in his chariot, and here it is, he's going along, right? But yet this man that has this elevated position in society, he also is humble. How? Because when Philip comes up to him and hears him reading, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? How many know, there's a lot of, I, I will tell you as a teacher, 
we have these big tests at the end of the year, these standardized tests. And whenever the I quit asking how the students felt about the test. When I first started teaching in public school, my students would go take this big test at the end of the year. I would see parts of it, and I knew it was so hard. And they'd come back to me, I'd say, how'd it go? they say, it was easy. I'm like, no, it wasn't easy. Anytime they came back and said it was easy, you knew you were in trouble because they did something like, oh, Christmas tree. Oh. <laughs> yeah. If you're not familiar with that expression, Christmas tree means that you just filled in the bubbles and got the test done, you know. And, yeah, let's see. C looks good. And A looks good. And D looks good. So you knew you were in trouble if they come back and said it was easy. The students that came back and said, oh, Mr. Strunk, it was hard. They tended to do better. Why? Because they really, they knew something about the test that it was difficult. They were willing to admit that. The other students either didn't realize it was hard or weren't willing to admit that it was hard. Anybody here ever acted like you knew more than what you know? Right? That's the proclivity of mankind. Here this high-ranking official, when he said, is asked by Philip, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless someone guides me? He didn't understand what he was reading. How do that's humility? Yes. So here's the first mark. There was humility with Philip, humility with the Ethiopian eunuch. One of the marks of genuine faith is humility. Notice that goes in contrast to pride. God resists the proud but gives grace to the who? One of the marks that you've received grace is that you're humble. You realize apart from Christ, you'd be lost and undone without God and His Son. You would realize that apart from Him, we can do nothing. Whether it be with being saved or whether it be empowered to live your Christian walk. To God be the glory as is on the front of our bulletin as we sing at the outset today. To God be all the glory. The psalmist says... Not to us, not to us, but to God be all the glory. And I've often said, I think God inspired the psalmist to put it twice because he knew, not to us, not to us, in case you were in doubt, not to you, not to you, but to God be all the glory. Yes. Here it is, Philip is humble. This Ethiopian eunuch is humble. A mark of the believer is that we will be humble. Jesus himself, Philippians chapter 2, Paul instructs believers there, have this attitude or this mind in you that also was in Christ that though he was in the form of God, and counted it not robbery to be equal with God, being the second person of the Godhead. Yet he humbled himself, coming from heaven to earth in the form of a man, and then being a servant, and then dying, and then dying a death on a cross. And because he was willing to be humbled, God has exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, heavens on, on, uh, of knees in heaven, on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How many know the believer is humble? Right? Here it is. When it is that you look here at the next thing that would be a mark of a genuine believer was his faith was scripture based. Scripture based. Notice Simon. Reread the passage again. Simon was drawn and enamored by all the signs and wonders. And listen, as I said before, I don't want to belittle Signs of what we still listen. If we didn't believe that God did miraculous things, we wouldn't have a prayer time. If I didn't believe God would hear and end up, does He always answer in the way that I would like? Do I always understand His answer to every prayer? Do I understand all the things that happen or don't happen to them? I don't, but I'm going to keep on praying. Amen. How many here will keep on praying with me? So I'm not belittling the miracles and the great things that God would do, but that's what Simon was enamored by, not by the word. And here it is. Is that what is the Ethiopian eunuch? He's there reading, and he's reading from Isaiah 52 or 50, 53. How many of you that share the gospel on a regular basis would love it if you came up to somebody and they were reading from Isaiah and you just said that? Do you understand what you're reading? And they said no. Like, well, let me tell you. How many say that would be a, a, an encounter you prayed for? Amen. <laughs> and so here it is, Philip. He starts sharing the gospel. It says he preached. Jesus. He preached a sermon to this individual. And what did he preach? He preached Jesus. He never, in the pages of the scripture, how did Philip end up on this road? An angel of the Lord himself came. And you know what most people will be doing today? They come to the sea of and say, you know, I see angels. Let me tell you about this angel. And my wonder, no, 
Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you. He is the one. You've asked, is it the prophet speaking of himself or someone else? I'll tell you who he was speaking about. He was speaking of Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. He was silent before his shears, but he opened not his mouth. And then he rose up from the dead. He died for your sins. He rose for your death. Let me tell you about Jesus. And he tells him about Jesus. And when he tells him about Jesus, that it's scripture based. This man, he has the next identification of a true believer. Humble, scripture based. The next would be this. Is that this fella, this Ethiopian eunuch, he has repentance. You may say, well, wait a minute. I don't see anywhere there where it says he repented of sin. This is true. But what does he ask? May I be baptized, right? May I be baptized? Right? Now, baptism, again, I point out in here, uh, our, our view here is baptism is, is uh, a representation of what has happened, spiritually speaking, and that it's for believers' baptism. But I will tell you, a genuine convert wants to be baptized, and part of that baptism is this. What is it that we say? And you know, when, we, when we're here in the fellowship hall, I'll ask two questions. I might ask it all in one, but it's two parts. Have you repented of sin? Have you put trust in Christ alone for salvation? Now I've asked folks that before they're baptized, but I asked them that so they publicly declare this. Can I tell you? By being dumped down in the water, that is, but when John the Baptist went about baptizing, everyone that came, that was a confession. They're saying, I'm a sinner, I need cleansed. Here was this man. He is repenting and confessing he's a sinner because Jesus had been preached to him, and no doubt Philip had mentioned. Baptism to him as well because a man has to be baptized. And what when he goes down, that's confessing. I am a sinner. I'm buried with Christ in baptism. When Jesus was baptized, had he committed any sin? No, Jesus never committed any sin. But what he was doing was he was identifying with the death that sinners should die because he was going to die on the cross for us. How many know the wages of sin is death? You know what we deserve? Death. And not just death like one and done. A lot of people could live with that kind of death but it's a death an eternal death like a life is eternal life death is an eternal death where the fire is not quenched and the worm doesn't die that's what we deserve and jesus bore that penalty for us on the cross and when it was that he uh, said that all he's identifying with sinners though he wasn't a sinner himself he didn't die or wasn't buried for his sins but for ours and then he's raised to walk in a newness of life this man by being baptized, asking to be baptized, when he goes under, that is a sign of repentance. That I'm buried with Christ in baptism. And then what is it? He's raised to walk in a newness of life. Now, when this man asks to be baptized, right? That's repentance. And this man says, can I be baptized? Philip says, if you believe with all your heart. What does this man say? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Isn't that what stuff that, that, that Jesus said? What was going to be preached in his name? Repentance of sins and faith in Christ. Repentance and faith. That's part of this Ethiopian eunuch's experience. Repentance and faith. So, so far, marks of genuine faith, humility, scripture-based, repentance, faith in Christ. And the last one is this. And don't miss this. Look at verse 39. It's still up there. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw, no longer saw him, but went on his way, what? Now, I would tell you, most of us, what would happen? If you're here with me, if this morning, before I say amen, an hour and a half, no, I'm kidding, we're closing in on the end of the message. Before, if before I said amen, all of a sudden I was snatched away, you might go out of this church this morning looking for me. I hope you would look for me. <laughs> Find me. <laughs> But if I was snatched away, maybe you'd be looking to see if there's any trap doors up here or something. I don't know what you do. But when you went down to the Cracker Barrel, when you finally got there, you might go in there and say, you know what happened in church this morning? <laughs> Our preacher was preaching, and God answered prayers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and he was snatched right away. <laughs> we prayed it would have happened 20 minutes ago. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but the preacher was snatched away, right? But this, and you might be in amazement, 
But what did this man do? He wasn't, he didn't care the least little bit. Philip may have left, but Christ remained. And here it is, I heard someone say, Alistair Begg, if you've ever heard him, he sounds smart, he has this, this Scottish accent. Everything sounds smarter with that accent. He said, a good teacher is like John the Baptist. He, he declares the way, or he clears the way, he declares the way, and then he gets out of the way. <laughs> That's what I mean. And what he meant by that is that this man would follow Jesus. And hear this man. He's re is he rejoicing because Philip's gone? No. He's rejoicing because he's experienced salvation. He has put his trust in this Jesus, the Messiah, proclaiming in scriptures. And he's forgiven. How many know that's something to be rejoicing about? We too often overlook joy. Some people think. Now listen, there are some people that, you know, they're filled with the... Uh, they have a put on and this sort of thing. But I would tell you, do you know part of the fruit of the Spirit is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? God gives us joy. The mark of the Christian isn't to knock your own persimmon juice all the time, all right? And, and, and now that doesn't mean life is all happy and slappy. We rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But how many are thankful? There is joy in the Lord. There's joy in the spirit of the Lord. And here it is. This man had joy. And he goes on his way rejoicing. And that is one of the marks of the genuine believer. Is that of joy. Go back. Remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus disappeared from them too, right? And they didn't say, wow, how did he pull that off? They weren't amazed by that. But what they said, did not our heart burn within us as he shared the word? And they went back to Jerusalem rejoicing to say, he's alive! He's alive! He's really alive. How many are thankful? There is joy in genuine faith. There is a mark of joy. Amen. Now this morning, we talked about false indicators and true indicators with regards to faith. False. Just want to do what's popular. Want to be prominent. Have some elevated position. Prosperity so that I can enjoy some of this Oh, things of this world and that he preserved from punishment but with no regards to righteousness just preserved from punishment we talked about marks of true faith humility scripture based repentance faith in Christ and joy now these two sermons I would tell you I started when I was putting together this series on the sermons in Acts a week ago when I started preparing for this message this week, I started to skip to Acts 10 because that's the next real major sermon. Notice here, were there a lot of sermon words spoken here? In fact, the words that are recorded as sermons, they're not to crowds. There were sermons to crowds that happened, but did we get those words here? No, the words we got were sermons to individuals, to Simon, the false one, to the Ethiopian eunuch, the true one. But I wanted to, to do this uh, message today not only to give us more history in the book of Acts and a progression here of the gospel spreading, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. The uttermost parts of the earth, by the way, it started here because uh, 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 the Ethiopian unit, he's going to go down to Ethiopia and church tradition will say that we have had a Christian church presence in Ethiopia for 2,000 years. Now, are there some false aspects, true as, as will always happen? Yes, but how many know this Ethiopian unit tradition will say he went back and started sharing the faith that he was now a part of. Amen. And so here it is, as we have his response. Simon, by the way, you want to say, did he repent? I'll tell you what, this scripture doesn't say he repented. And church tradition will tell you that Simon the magician from Samaria, he was the one, and some of you will be familiar with this, I won't go into it this morning, he was one that started bringing Gnosticism into the church, which was a terrible, terrible thing. And he, he so far as we know, he did not repent, but he went down the way showing that his false faith never uh, turned to true faith. But I wanted to point this out also because of this. Both of these sermons, though not sermons as we would think of them, when we think of sermons, we think at least some group of people, small or large, but some group of people, these sermons were directed toward individuals. But can I tell you, by the power of the Spirit and the truth of God's Word, in some sense, every sermon is directed to an individual. Why? I, I will tell you, and again, all glory to God, but I can preach a message and I'll talk with some folks afterwards and some person tell me they got this out of it, some person tell me they got this out of it. I'm not smart enough to make <laughs> to, to, to have that happen, but can I tell you, 
God's Spirit is with God's Word. And if God's Word is preached, whether by me or by anyone else, God's Spirit can, so to speak, tailor that right to the heart of an individual and for them to have a response there too. Amen. How we are thankful that God does that with His Word. Yeah. Only His Word and Spirit yeah. will do that to help us to grow. So we know what these guys the response was to their individual sermon. One rejecting, showing his faith was false. One accepting, showing his faith was true. What are our individual responses to the word of God? I pray it would be, God, I want to be one that follows you in humility. I want to be one that follows you confessing my need for you. I want to be one who follows you confessing Jesus Christ is the son of God. I want to be one who follows you. And indeed, who walks in the joy of the Spirit. Who is not concerned about the things and the notoriety and the fame and fortunes of this world. But I want all that I am and all that I have for all of my days, by your grace and for your glory, to be in your service. How many want to follow after him? Amen. Amen. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we come to you today. First and foremost, Lord, if there be anybody here this morning that's not a believer in Jesus Christ, they not repented of sin and put trust in Him. Or perhaps through the power of your Holy Spirit, it's very possible in any setting that there could be one that like Simon the magician had professed a faith in you and yet by the characteristic traits show that his faith was false. Being more concerned about things of this world, being concerned about popularity and prominence and the prosperity of this world's goods and esteem and to be concerned as well with simply preservation from judgment, but not with genuine repentance and walking in righteousness. Could be that you would convict someone of being a false convert this morning. Lord, whatever be the nature, if there's somebody that knows not Christ, I pray this morning that by the conviction of your spirit and the truth of your word, they would repent of sin humbly, confessing that they are a sinner and acknowledging that you are the only Savior. And that they would repent of sin and profess Christ and put trust in Him alone. And to walk in the joy of salvation that is the apportionment to the believer. And Lord, this morning, if there's anyone that knows not Christ, I pray they come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. And Lord, for those who are your children this morning... I pray that like this Ethiopian eunuch, that we would walk in humility, that we would indeed be quick to yield to the conviction of the Spirit, and Lord, to be cleansed. Pray that we indeed would be those who follow you and walk, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and to tell of him wherever we would go, and that we would walk in the joy that comes only genuinely from your Holy Spirit. For indeed, those who are your children, those indeed who walk in your spirit, know of the joy of your salvation. Lord, be with my brothers and be with my sisters this day. Bless them, strengthen them. We lift up again, especially this morning, our dear sister Cindy and brother Mike and their family. For your comfort and for your strength to be extended to them. Lord, we... Pray for your hand to be upon every request, spoken and unspoken this morning. Bless my brothers and my sisters. I pray that this day, that as the name of Jesus is lifted up, that indeed we would be encouraged and strengthened, buoyed on in hope to lift up in prayer, Lord, various needs, knowing that there is nothing beyond the scope of your power. And indeed, dear God, though we not uh, uh, follow you simply for the sake of signs and wonders and miracles we are thankful lord that you were doing those as the word was going forth and as as it was that your power was seen and we pray dear god that your power would move in various situations and circumstances this morning and we thank you for what we have seen and pray that you would be glorified thereby yes. lord we come to you this day bless encourage strengthen my brothers and my sisters in their most holy faith it's in that name of Jesus that we pray in the power of the Spirit that we come. And all of God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is a hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
and the surpassing greatness of His power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you today in Jesus' name.